Good evening. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. This is the Calvary Grace Bible study. Will you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we just praise you. We worship you. We honor you. We're here, Father, to read your word and to study it together. Bring it alive. Let it touch our hearts, our minds, and our very souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are starting now the sixth chapter of Ephesians. And uh, the second half of this chapter is perhaps one of the most powerful chapters in your New Testament. Where we start dealing with the world of the unseen. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. But here in this part of the passage... We're going to read some of Paul's writings that make a lot more sense when you understand how Paul wrote and some of the idioms that he used and the way that he wrote. We'll explain it as we go in a few minutes. Let's start in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. And it says, Children, Obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is a slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Amen. When you first look at this passage, it really looks as though he's just talking to children and to slaves. But the truth is, it's much more profound than that, much deeper than that. The word here used for children is the word technon. There are, by the way, three words in Greek that are used in your Bible for children or child. And the technon is used 77 times, 21 of which refers to a son and once to a daughter. Technon refers to offspring or children, to a male child, but it's also a metaphor. It's also the name transferred to an inmate or reciprocal relationship formed between men by the bonds of love and friendship and trust, just as parents and children. In other words, it is not necessarily for that of a child. For example, how many kids in our Sunday school read this passage? And since they probably don't read it, not because they can't read, but because it's just not necessarily shown to them, maybe this has a message for adults. And it carries on and says, Technon is an affectionate address, such as patrons, helpers, teachers, and alike employ 
as they talk to the children under them. Some might say, my child, or little one, technon. In the New Testament, pupils or dis uh, disciples are called children of their teachers because of the latter by their instruction nourish the minds of their pupils and mold their characters. We're called children of God throughout the New Testament. Again, the writings of Paul. And in the Old Testament, the people of Israel are called children of God. And especially, we read, dear child of God. We read that a lot in the New Testament. Wait till we get to dealing with 1 John. In Paul's writings, all who are led by the Spirit of God are closely related to God or are considered to be children of God, technon of God. So when the passage starts out with, children or dear children or little children it is not necessarily referring to little ones it can but it most often refers to big ones to you and me and it's a statement to us you say well I'm not a child no but you were we were all somebody's children we all had parents and sometimes we're dealing with parents in the Lord. Back to the beginning, it says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Notice the little phrase, in the Lord. It doesn't just say, children, obey your parents, because this is right. It says, obey your parents in the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Turn to Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. We're going to read a similar, in fact, almost a parallel passage here. And then I'll come back and we'll talk a bit more about what it means to be a child in the Lord and parents in the Lord. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they'll become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do not, uh, pardon me, and do it not only when their eye is on you to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence in the Lord or for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for men. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong. There is no favoritism. That, by the way, is almost, almost word for word of our passage tonight. I wonder if Paul, having written Ephesians, goes on to write Colossians and sits there and thinks to himself about what he wrote in Ephesians. He would not have had a copy of it, but he would have it fresh in his memory as he begins to write and begins to pour out on the page his thoughts. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, we read more of the writings of Paul. And as we look at his writings, we start to understand why he is referring to people as children. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14, it says, I'm not writing you this to shame you, but to warn you. My dear children, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you don't have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I am sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing, and then I, uh, and then I will find, uh, find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. 
For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love with a gentle spirit? Here he's telling them, look, you've got 10,000 people that will put into your life, but not too many that you could call your spiritual fathers. Many of these people he would have personally led to the Lord. Incidentally, he didn't baptize them. He talks about the fact on one occasion that he's glad he didn't baptize them because they'd argue over who was baptized by who. But he calls himself their father. Now this does not mean that Paul went around to be known as a Catholic priest, a father. In fact, the New Testament forbids calling the pastor of a church the father. But Paul brings to light and to life the thought that he has led many of these people to Christ. And while they have lots of guardians, lots of people that were put into their lives, they need to pay attention to those that led them to the Lord. Those that initially crossed that great divide and spoke to them about the Lord that could be considered their spiritual father or spiritual mother. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. And again, here he makes it clear, this was through the gospel. And I think we need to be very careful here. I've known of many churches that really went to the nth degree with this, and their pastor became the controller of the church and therefore the controller of the families and therefore the controller of the, the money in the families and who goes to what school and who takes what education and who does what, you know, they, they start to micromanage people. This is not what Paul is talking about. He's saying, I became your father through the gospel. Through the story of Jesus Christ who came for the lost. And I ministered that to you. And so as your spiritual father, you owe me a little bit of respect. Not blind favor, but a little bit of respect. In Galatians chapter 4 verse 19, we read this. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. I kind of like that. My dear children, for whom I'm in the pains of childbirth until Christ has formed you. Listen to it in the King James. My, my dear children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ is formed in you. He is talking about spreading the gospel to these people and the, 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 the emotional pains and even the spiritual pains that he was suffering, that Christ would be formed in those that he was speaking to. My parents suffered a great deal for me, as no doubt yours did for you. Now, there are some times that people have bad parents there are some times that even believers have unbelievers as parents. And that's why I don't think this is a blanket statement to blindly obey your parents. Because there are times when parents will advise children to do things which are flatly against the word of God. But he is talking here of those that have led you to the Lord. Don't just write them off. Sometimes you've got to reach forward for people, and sometimes you've got to reach back to some that have done you good. To stretch your hand back. And to take the hold of those whose knees might become feeble, who might be becoming weak. And to be kind and to bless them. How I wish I could be with you until now and change my tone because I'm perplexed about you. That's Paul's writing. Turn to Titus. 
chapter 1, verse 1. Paul uses this kind of idiom frequently. Titus 1, 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my son, or true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Again and again and again, we hear Paul talking to people in the churches and addressing them as children and as his sons. Turn to Philemon, chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal, appeal to you for my son Omnisimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become both useful to you and to me. I am sending him who is my very heart back to you. And so you can see that Paul frequently uses this kind of statement to refer to people to whom he had spread the gospel, people that he had ministered into their lives, had led them to the Lord and became, in a sense, their spiritual fathers. Children, obey your fathers. And then we come to another writer in the New Testament. One that's not as prolific as Paul, but one that uses this kind of idiom over and over and over again. In fact, eight times in his book, one book. He will write the book of John, the gospel. He will write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He will also write the book of Revelation. Remarkable books. And in 1st John, we read something interesting. It starts out in 1st John chapter 2, verse 1. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anyone does sin, we have one that speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 12. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you've known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome evil, the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. Dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. And even now, many Antichrists have come. This is how we know uh, it, it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they didn't really belong to us. For if they'd belonged to us, they would, not have, they would have remained. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, dear children, continue in him, so that he, when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone that does what is right is born of him. First John chapter 3, verse 7. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He that does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. And he that does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning since the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's works. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. Dear children, let us not love with words, 
or with the tongue, but with actions and truth. This then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. First John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits and see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize every spirit of God, the spirit of God, and every spirit that, pardon me, every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come uh, in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and is even now already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one that is in you is greater than the one that's in the world. That's worth an amen. amen. And here's the final one in 1 John. Last few words John will write. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. 1 John 5, 21. Now, my parents are dead. And perhaps some of your parents are dead as well. But we are all still children. We all still came from somewhere. We had a mother and a father. If you didn't, well, then you're different. God bless you. But I did. And everybody I know did. But what about the ones that didn't necessarily raise us, but led us to the Lord? And the Bible is basically saying, look, don't just write them off. Everybody needs two people in their lives. They need a Paul who puts into them and a Timothy to whom they minister. Everybody needs a Paul and a Timothy. Somebody they're reaching down to and somebody they're reaching back to. Over the years of my ministry, I have been asked some tremendous biblical questions. Some of them I can answer quite easily because I've studied. Some of them I can't. And my answer is, listen, I don't know. But I'll find out. And I would call people like Dr. Hawking, who in my opinion was perhaps the greatest theological mind alive in our generation. And say, Dr. David, this has been asked of me. What, what do you feel is the answer? And he would give me his opinion. Don't forget those that have put into you, dear children. In verse two of our passage tonight, it would carry on and would say, honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. By the way, I believe this also applies most certainly to the family relationship. Honor your father and mother. I have to say that many of the things that I didn't do as a young man was out of respect for my father and the position it would put him in. I'm nothing special and I don't claim to be anything special. Believe me when I say this. But there were many situations that I found myself in where I could have got into a lot of trouble but I thought, no, this will reflect bad on my dad's ministry. And so I controlled my mouth, I controlled my behavior, I controlled my actions because of how it would reflect on my dad. Honor your father and mother. Well, they're dead. Well, there are many things I know about my dad and my mother, which I'm not going to tell you. I know they're dead, I know they're gone, but why would I dishonor their memory? Why would I dishonor them? 
What value would it bring to me to bring dishonor on them, even though they've passed on? And the Bible says this is the first commandment that will extend your life, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. What a remarkable statement. Fathers, don't exasperate your children. This goes for physical fathers and spiritual fathers. Don't exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. We all know that passage off by heart. Train up a child in the way that he shall go, and when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Sometimes parents get a little bit discouraged. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Devil's angry. Sometimes parents get a little bit discouraged because they put good stuff into their children, but it just appears like bad stuff is coming out of them. But you need to understand, the passage doesn't say turn up a child in the way that they shall go, and they'll never be bad. It says train up a child in the way that they shall go, and when they're old, they'll not depart from it. You put in good, good will come out. Amen. If you've ever programmed a computer, you know very well, garbage in, garbage out. If you program the wrong if and then statement, then the wrong if and then will come out. At a time when you don't want it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, Paul is speaking now as a father to his children. And here's what he's going to write. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my endurance, my love, persecutions and sufferings. What kinds of things have happened to me in Antioch, Iconium and Lystra, and the persecutions I endured. You know, that's a family relationship. When you take on a relationship, you don't just take on the happy times people have. You take on some of the sad times and the difficult times. It might be nice if we just all had rainbows and butterflies. Every day, all the time. But sometimes there are thunderstorms and hurt and pain. And Paul writes to these people here in, uh, uh, to Timothy, who he calls his son. And he says to him, you know about my teaching, my life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance. And then he says, my persecutions, sufferings, and all that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, and the persecutions I endured. See, that's a family relationship. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone that wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived, but you, Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned it and how from infancy, listen, somebody got saved, they were a spiritual infant. How from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. In other words, you started out and you were given the Scriptures and you began to learn and develop and produce and, and, and you began to grow in the Lord. All scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped in every good work. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. Timmy, you got some good stuff in you, boy. I know your grandmother, I know your mother. I can see that same anointing 
coming down that family line to you. Tim, as I'm your spiritual father, I tell you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of because you know those from whom you have learned it. You understand that I have gone through so much for the gospel's sake. And so I tell you, boy, be strong in your faith. And even just as a child, when you were growing up from, as an infant, your earthly mother and earthly father had put into you the scriptures. They're able to make you wise for salvation. And by the way, all scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training, in righteousness so that the man of God which is going to be you Timothy may be thoroughly equipped for every good work turn to Hebrews chapter 12 for a moment Hebrews chapter 12 endure hardship as discipline for God is treating you as sons for what son does not discipline by his father? By the way, some of the ladies might find that a little bit offensive. I'm not a, I'm not a son, I'm a daughter. Well, that's okay, don't worry. We men are part of the bride of Christ, so you cheer up. Amen. Rather than wasting words, he just talks about sons. God is treating you as sons, for what son is not disciplined by his father? What you're learning here is that from time to time, life is not going to go your way. Suck it up. And don't say to yourself, why has God allowed this? Why is God bringing this on me? Why, why, why? Understand, sometimes you're getting a spanking. Sometimes God is dealing with you as a parent would deal with a child. Now I know today we don't spank children anymore. We're so much more educated than that. And that's why the world is so good now. And everything is doing so well. Verse 8, if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you're Ill illegitimate children and not true sons. You know, you, you see this in blended families. Now, I'm not making any accusations or referring to any specific family. Be very clear here. But when a, another person comes into a family, such as a man marrying into a family where there are already children, or for that matter, a woman marrying in where a father has already got children. Those children will inadvertently and almost certainly turn around at some point and say, well, you're not my father. Or you're not my mother. And they're right. And the very best that that one marrying in can be is a good guide. And a stand-in parent. But the effect of that is that the one marrying in will discover that they're probably not the very best to punish the children. That has to be done by their remaining parent. And so the Bible talks about that very fact and says then your illegitimate children and not true sons. You don't actually, you're not actually the children's parent. And you shouldn't or can't be the one punishing them. It needs to come from their parent, their earthly parent. 
But God is treating you as true children when he punishes you. He is treating you as his children. And go ahead and turn around to him and say, you're not my daddy. Moreover, we all have had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while while they thought it best, but God disciplines us for our good. You know, sometimes things go wrong because we've been stepping out of line. Not always. There are a myriad of reasons why things can go wrong. But at least one purpose behind it is that God is trying to change your direction, change your way of thinking, send you in a better direction that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. I remember the last spanking I got. I had been teaching judo for several years. I went on to karate, but I started out in judo and jujitsu. And I don't remember what I did, but my mother got ticked off and she grabbed the belt and she came after me and she was whooping around my legs and going around me. And I just stood there. I said, are you finished? She cracked up and she realized that was never going to be beneficial ever again. From then on, she found other miserable ways to punish me. She was still a good mother and the best mother in the world. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching. When I was a boy in my father's house, still tender and only a child of my mother, he taught me and said, Lay hold of my words with all your heart. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her. She will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. Esteem her, and she will exalt you. Embrace her, and she will honor you. She will set a garland of grace on your head and present you with a crown of splendor. Listen, my son. Accept what I say, and the years of your life will be many. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. And when you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you'll not stumble. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evil men. Avoid it. And do not turn on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot sleep till they do evil. They have robbed, or they are robbed of slumber till they make someone fall. 
They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of the dawn shining ever brighter until the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is deep darkness. They don't know what makes them stumble. Pay attention, my son, to what I say. Listen closely to my words and don't let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart for they are life to those who find them and health to a man's whole body. Everyone else, guard your heart. Above all else, pardon me, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. Put away perversity from your mouth and keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet and take only ways that are firm. Do not swerve to the right or to the left, but keep your foot from evil. All the way through, he's saying, listen, my son, listen. Pay attention to what I'm saying. Well, because I'm not a boy anymore, does that mean that I don't need to worry about that? Has my heart become less the wellspring of life? Is wisdom less important to me? Or should I say I am a son no matter what my age? And therefore these things apply to me. And maybe, maybe, maybe by extension to you. In our passage tonight, he goes on in verse 5, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, chapter 6, verse 5. And he says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. The word here for slave is not necessarily what we think of. It's the word in Greek, doulos. It's the word for servant and to serve the Lord. And we are all meant to be the doulos of the Lord, the servants of the Lord. The old King James, I think, names it better. It says, servants, obey your earthly masters. I remember a young man once that uh, was trying to fight the fact that his girlfriend was trying to lead him to the Lord. And he got very angry when he came and he read this. He said, slaves, we don't have slaves. We don't want slaves. This is wrong. We, we should have nothing to do with slavery. Well, in point of fact, it's not actually talking about slaves as we know them. You see, in the ancient times, there were two kinds of people that served in a household. There were slaves, but there were also servants. Slaves were bought. And the Bible talks about us being bought by the blood of Christ. But servants were paid. And in many cases, a servant growing up in a household, their children would become servants in the household of the children of the master. For generations down, and as a matter of fact, they would even go so far as to have their ear pierced and a certain ring put in their ear to indicate what household they belonged to. But that was different to slavery. That was servanthood. And the word doulos here re refers to servants. Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear. And with a sincere heart, just as you would obey Christ. I wonder how many people go to work and think of the fact that their bosses will and wish, if it's just and right, is in fact an extension of the Word of God and the direction God would have them go in. If God gave you the job, should you treat your boss as an idiot? I have worked for some that were, but I treated them with respect. 
And if I felt that they were really too far out, too far gone, I quit the job. And I moved somewhere else. Verse 6, obey them, not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like servants or slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. In other words, listen, don't just obey them when they're looking at you, but obey them when they're not looking at you. It's not just that their eye is on you and you realize that, and so you're going to toe the line. We had a young man in the church many years ago. He was brain damaged. And uh, when he would see me coming into the church, he would say rather loudly, look out, here comes the pastor, hide your sin. Well, you shouldn't need to hide your sin. God is always watching. And he says here, listen, obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like servants of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve them right and serve them well. Perhaps some of the best advice my father ever gave me, he gave me a lot, was the first day I went to work, my first day of work. I always went up and said goodbye to my father before I left the house a practice I still maintain with my wife. I never leave the property without saying goodbye and letting her know where I'm going. But this particular day was my first day of work. I was nervous. I said, okay, Dad, I'm, I'm, I'm off to work. I'll, I'll see you later. And he said, son, I have some advice for you. Okay, I'm running late, but what is it? He said, make yourself indispensable. Don't do the least, do the most. Make it so that that business does not run well without you. And that stuck with me to this day. Make yourself indispensable. Very good fatherly advice. Serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving the Lord, not men. Boy, I tell you, wouldn't that just change our generation today if, if just the believers alone thought like that? instead of trying to scrape another dime out of the company. We live in a very lazy generational time. People don't want to work anymore. They don't want to go to work anymore. Serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not men. God has given you a job, do it properly. Do it to the very best of your ability. Be exemplary. Maybe your behavior and your actions will lead someone to Christ at some point. Wouldn't it be a grand shame if somebody came along and said, well, I knew a Christian once and they were the laziest. I remember talking to somebody and they were telling me that they worked at a certain place and I said, oh, I, I, I know somebody that works there. A person in our church works there. They said, oh, what, what's the name? And I told them the name. They said, that person goes to church? Already I'm starting to small, feel small. They said, yeah, yeah, they, 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 they do. Why, that is the most foul-mouthed, evil individual you could possibly imagine. And they go to church? Are you sure? The same guy? I said, yeah. 
He's the same person. What a shame if that's you and your behavior turns somebody from the gospel. Serve wholeheartedly as if serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. The Lord will reward everyone. You know, the Bible ends with this. I'm paraphrasing, but it's pretty correct. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Now, our salvation is not works-based. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But the reward that we receive in eternity is works-based. Even the punishment in hell is works-based, believe it or not. Jesus would say it is more tolerable, will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of my return than it will be for you. He talks about the fact that there are levels of tolerability for those that are being punished. And we know that in heaven on the other side, the Bible talks very clearly about crowns and rewards and things that we will receive. There is in store for me a crown of glory and so on. Not only for me, but also for all who believe and long for the coming of the Lord. There are rewards and levels of rewards, and it's based on how we act down here now. How we behave. And masters, treat your slaves or your servants, your doulos, in the same way. Just because somebody is over you or under you, don't you dare abuse them. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven. And there's no favoritism with him. Really, you think you're someone? Remember, we all serve the same God. And you stand and fall before him, not your boss. Not the company you work for, but before him. And so we put our best foot forward because we're serving the Lord even when we go to work. <laughs> Incidentally, do you know who in the Old Testament was not permitted to tithe? I don't know if I should tell you this or not, but you're all adults. Prostitutes were not permitted to tithe because that could not be considered work ordained by God. None of us are being sent out to the strip clubs to work for Jesus. But God is sending us out into this world to be lights in a dark world. To represent him. And to represent him well. Watch your mouth. Watch your behavior. Watch your actions. Be careful and cautious about how you behave. You represent the master. And not just the master, but the master's master. who has given his own life for you. You were purchased. And the Bible calls you a purchased possession. You're owned by him. Yeah. And so we're told very carefully, listen, if you've got power or control over somebody, don't threaten them. Don't be harsh with them. Treat them kindly. Pay them properly. Pay them well. And then the same thing goes to them. They must now work for you and earn it. And do not a passable job, but the very best that they're able to do. In doing this, we demonstrate our belief 
in him who is just and fair and righteous. Next week, we'll go on to we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But notice where it is. It's right on the back of this argument. It's not a whole new thing. It's, it's part of this same argument of masters and servants and how we're to act. And then finally he'll come around and say, listen, you're not actually fighting against people. Sometimes you're fighting against spirits that you don't really understand. We'll hit that next week head on. May the Lord bless you. Would you bow your heads with me? Precious Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, cause us to be good servants, good masters. You are our example. You are fair and just and righteous in all that you do. Let us be the same, Father, in Jesus' name. Let us be fair and just and righteous in whatever we lay our hands to. Mm -hmm. Lord, we are human, we're not perfect. Thank you for your mercy and thank you for your grace. Thank you that you have saved us in spite of ourselves and forgiven us our iniquities. And you've not led us into temptation, but you have in fact delivered us from evil. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, help us to show kindness and grace and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.